Theoretical Times, a podcast series between Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and welcome to the next edition of Theoretical Times. And we have a new theorist. And I know this all comes as a shock to some people, but this is another French theorist. But he's a special French theorist, because actually there's a third person in my marriage, and his name is Paul Virilio. Our entire marriage, Steve has spent working with and thinking about Paul Virilio. Indeed, the Virilio that I knew as a theorist before I met Steve was really a guy who explored technology, speed and architecture. But through watching Steve's work in the last decade or so, I really realised that Paul Virilio is much more than simply a theorist of speed. Virilio was born in 1932 in beautiful Paris, and like many scholars of his age, the Second World War had a profound impact on him. In fact, he once said that the war was his university. He learned about bunkers, he learned about speed, he learned about space, he learned about technology, and he's helped all of us understand modernity in new ways. So, hi Steve. And Steve, I in my introduction about Paul Virilio, I mentioned bunkers, and in 1958, Virilio investigated 15,000 Nazi bunkers that were built along the coast of France. Why did he do that? <laughs> and how do you see the impact of the Second World War on his work and his career? Yes, Virilio is certainly, as he called himself, a war baby. A great deal, if not all, <laughs> His work emerges from the position of having been in the war um, as a young man. And I think particularly the bunker story is an interesting one from that point of view. He, what he developed what he called bunker archaeology. Um, and it came from photographing. It initially came from photographing the bunkers along the Atlantic Wall. And all sorts of really interesting bunker archaeologies have developed, both through him and other people, as a result of that. But he was interested in the, um, the development of two things, I think, particularly military technology, and of course the bunkers were military technology, but also um, the idea of movement and of speed, and particularly movement in architecture. And what he and uh, his co-architectural theorist, Claude Perron, who's still alive, did was develop a theory which they called architecture principe, which was actually architecture beginning again. It's literally architecture beginning again. And their group in the 1960s was really important. They developed a um, basically a, a, a function of the oblique, and that was really getting rid of horizontality and verticality. You know, as you did in the 1960s. Hey, and, but it was particularly to do with movement, and it all came from his ideas uh, around the bunker, actually. Uh, he developed architecture and literally um, practised uh, architecture, although, although he never qualified, uh, in building bunk bunker churches, which uh, he was involved in. He was an anarchistic Christian, and he, uh, he liked building bu bunker churches. But I think particularly what I've taken from, from that early work is what I call bunker anthropology. It's partly a joke around uh, bunker archaeology, which was um, Virilio's label. But I've developed, uh, not so much um, out of Virilio, but as a kind of jumping off point, the idea of bunker anthropology. And part of that is to do with um, ethnography and other kind of research methods from the position of almost being claustrophobic, closed in, wow. foreclosed, which is, again, one of the concepts that really uses in all sorts of ways. It's interesting. It fits the global financial crisis quite well. But the idea of closing in, and Birini actually is uh, a sufferer of claustrophobia, and you get that in his work. So I think there's all sorts of interesting aspects of that photography of the bunker. 
Look, there is, and we'll come back to that claustropolitan issue shortly when we're talking about his writing and his prose. And just for listeners, what I'll do is I'll do a link to Steve's piece uh, on the relationship and work between Perrault and Virilio. You published that in Topia, didn't you? That yes. Canadian, was it Canadian Cultural Studies Journal? Yes, I did. And also in my, I developed it a lot in uh, my book, We Have Never Been Postmodern, right. which we can also but, put a link but to. I'll, because it's open access, I'll yep. do a nice link Absolutely. to that. Yep. And also we did a film while we were living in Eastbourne in the United Kingdom yes. on the bunker. And so I will yes. put a link to the YouTube film for that as well. Yep. Oh, who knew? Sonic references. We're doing well, Steve. But but considering the planning of the bunkers, and indeed Virilio's that great phrase he used, logistics of perception, uh, and the, the logistics of perception I think were used by the French military after the Gulf War, mm. with all that sort of logistics emphasis, why is he known as the theorist of the accident? Well, it all goes back to his basis in French phenomenology and a pretty narrow part of French phenomenology. Um, and even though people uh, have tried to put him in the post-structuralist and post-modernist categories, I think that is misleading. He comes from French phenomenology. He was taught by people like Maurice um, Murdoch-Ponty and Jean Wall at the University of Sorbonne. And that style and structure of French phenomenology never left him. And I think the idea of the accident, and he has become a theorist of the accident, and we talk about accident in terms of catastrophe, but really where, that, where it comes from in Brilio's work is actually uh, phenomenology and the split between what they call accident and substance. So right. there is a different kind of use of the term accident in Brilio, although he does embrace the idea of catastrophe and collapse and so on Through as well. Katrina, for example, he did some of that work on yep. the Katrina. Yep. Yeah, but particularly the idea of technology for him is, for example, train, train crash, plane, plane crash. So there's always in his theory of technology this um, inside possibility of catastrophe. And that, that's to do with the phenomenological background he comes from and this idea of accident and substance. And that has an interesting structural, rather than structuralism, a structural link with how Foucault configured resistance, for example. So resistance comes from power. So the accident comes from the invention. So the train crash comes from the train. So you've got capitalism as a discourse and the resistance to capitalism, Marxism, comes from within it. So that's a quite an interesting disciplinary parallel too, Steve. Yes, it is, although I think Virilio comes from a different tradition. I say the yeah. particularly the subjectivist phenomenology that he comes from. Actually, he has a fairly conventional theory of power. He never really engaged with, any, no. with Foucault at all, for example, as far as I know, although he had all sorts of links with people like Baudrillard uh, before he died uh, for a very long time, also people like Guattari, uh, he never really had any contact with Foucault and, the, and that tradition at yeah. all. Um, but he has a fairly conventional theory of power and uh, really doesn't develop it very much. Where he's interesting, I think, is all, all, in all his work on speed and technology uh, and space um, and the way that we've shrunk the world through technology, as he would see it. Very interesting theorisation of power. I think you're right. He tends to configure power as almost a neutral formation. Yeah. It's not yeah. positive. It's not reactive. It yeah. just simply yeah, is. Yeah, there's no theory of the state there like there is in, in many of the other theorists that we've looked at in theoretical times. And indeed who are their contemporaries. So that's very interesting. You have mentioned speed, so let's get into it. Because the other key variable in Virilio's work, with, of course, big resonance in media, communication and cultural studies, is dromology. Now, dromos comes from the Greek road or indeed entrance. Now, I always find that quite interesting, road or entrance. So dromology is not a study of roads. <laughs> it's not a study of transportation systems. It's not even really a study of entrances. So how is he using dromology? Um, yes, Virilio certainly is a theorist of speed, although I think that's been overemphasised if you actually look at the whole body of work. And his, you know, one of his most popular books is called Speed and Politics. But, um, and I, I actually jump again, using him to jump off into a theoretical edifice. I developed the ideas around my theory of accelerated culture from Virilio, but he never uses those sorts of terms, and he certainly wouldn't see 
uh, his work is um, developing into what I talked about. But I think the idea of speed is interesting. And he certainly had in that, in that Greek um, legacy something to do with speed. I mean, Dromos also refers to race course, for example. Yes. And, it, you know, the idea of race, as in speed, yes. uh, is interesting to Virilio. And he certainly is a self-styled dromologist. Um, and he developed that quite, in, uh, uh, quite well and, qu- and, and in quite an interesting way in, in his early part of his career, you know, 1970s particularly, uh, when Speed and Politics first came out. And I think he has something to say in those areas, but a lot of it is actually over-determined by his interest in technology. And where he's a very good war theorist uh, and his ideas of pure war is that, you know, the technologies around war at the moment, for example, in Syria and in Iraq, are incredibly virilian. And in earlier wars um, that we know about uh, in our lives, you know, he talked about war at the speed of light. And he, he predicted much of what we see in war today to do with the, the speed of war, partly through um, his ideas on drones, predatory drones, like the predator military, drones. The French military actually used his expertise. They did. Point, they? Yeah, they did. Uh, and he's talked about in military academies, which he's really proud of. <laughs> which again shows his theorisation of power perhaps is lacking. Yeah. Where I'd like to finish is in some ways, ironically, what's become a sub-theme of these podcasts that we've conducted. And it's actually about writing and the audience for scholarship, I think. And I didn't know we'd go there. But I thought for Virilio we would talk about that. And perhaps unlike the other French theorists, Lacan particularly, looking at you, Uma, Uma Gay, Virilio is pithy and he's sharp in his prose. I think it makes him different from the other French scholars. I'll just give you some examples. Quote, war was my university. Everything has proceeded from there. The invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. The speed of light does not merely transform the world. It becomes the world. Globalization is the speed of light. End of quote. That is just extraordinary. I mean, they're almost T-shirt slogans. They are fabulous. Tell me a little bit about Virilio's writing and relationship to an audience and indeed his audience that may be different from say a Zizek or a Badieu. Yeah he's certainly an aphorist, he's a very good aphorist. Yes. Uh, is another very good aphorist uh, and they were you know long-term friends. Um, I think m- one of the things that I've got from him is uh, say a- an aphorism which is actually in uh, pure war third edition, which came out in 2008, he talks about us as a world having moved from cosmopolis to claustropolis. And that certainly could and should be a t-shirt slogan. And what I did, again jumping off from Virilio, I developed the idea in my work of claustropolitanism, which is really a kind of cultural condition Virilio didn't mean claustropolis in quite that way. But I think, you know, the current condition that we have globally where the rich live in gated communities and most of the rest of us want to leave the planet um, (laughs) is, you know, is a good one. And and we're foreclosed, you know, everything's closing in. I think Virilio gave us evocatively something in that aphorism, and he does it brilliantly. Um, Those absent from the stadium are always right. uh, is a classic um, from, you know, from uh, early 1980s. I've been trying to get my colleague uh, Mark Perryman at Philosophy Football to put that on a T-shirt for about 25 years. Shut uh, up, Mark. Do it now, brother. It'll come sometime. And also, um, I think Virilio would benefit from an international journal of Virilio studies like Baudrillard, Zizek and Badia. I think that'll come too. But I think part of it is... Part of his attraction is this kind of quirky, aphoristic writing. And he very often tabloidizes it it by putting everything in capitals, you know. It's like reading the Daily Mirror in Britain. Um, But I think he does have a really strange relationship to writing and the audience. I remember Simon Reynolds, the popular music writer, saying to me when we were all trying to put Virilio and... um, beats per minute in dance music together. And I think we can do that quite productively still today. He, he said, why doesn't he put his ideas together logically? And it's certainly true that Virilio tends to put two and two together and make five. 
but it's incredibly poetic. And um, I think it comes, again, from that phenomenology tradition where writing in that sense is very important in a particular way, a poetic, a poetics, if you like. And I think sometimes he's very confusing because he, he does jump off which is why I used him in particular ways, into all sorts of different areas. I mean, the kind of areas of, of study that you can apply Virilio to is, are just mammoth. You know, it's astonishing. He's not just a war theorist, he's an architectural theorist, he's a social theorist, even though he talks about his interest being politics and war, not sociology. I mean, he's an, he seems to me to be an important urban theorist, uh, theorist of people wanting to leave the planet, uh, of ecology and catastrophe and so on. So um, he's amazing in that sense. His audiences are huge. But I think in some ways why he's um, still a kind of quirky writer on the side, and he's still alive uh, writing in his 80s, is that it doesn't always necessarily fit together logically. You know, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's interesting you've used the word poetic there, and in some ways when I read him, and I did before you and I met and yeah. got married and so forth, I read him as a theorist of technology. Yeah. In media communication, cultural studies, yeah. and he, he helped us move into a certain stage of digitisation. Yeah. But you've used poetic, and indeed, I find it quite like poetry when I'm reading him, mm. intensified by the fact that his books are getting smaller. So what's happening is these books in his later career are resembling poetry books, mm. like the sort of T.S. Mm. Eliot four quartets. They're, mm. they're of that size. So mm. how important is the book, even though they're small books, to Virilio's continued development? Yes, I think he's always written small books, but he certainly is writing smaller books. The most recent being translated into English is The Administration of Fear, really well worth reading on lots of things from the Manhattan Project to social media. Yeah. And actually on social media, if anybody wants to analyse Twitter, Facebook, etc., use Virilio. He's, he's he incredibly imp important for that. But again, it's very oblique. Um, I think he, he certainly always used the idea of being an artist. You know, he did stained glass work for Matisse and for Brack. That was his, that was his uh, that's what he started yeah. with, yeah. He wasn't an academic in any of the senses that uh, these other th theorists that we've used in theoretical times are. And, and so, in a sense, he was always an outsider. You know, the students voted him in as Professor of Architecture after May 1968. He, he never qualified as an architect uh, and drove uh, Perron's office absolutely mad as a result of being around there. But he was always a fascinating outsider. I think he's seen himself as an outsider artist always and he's never stopped actually so he sees the book this you know the small pithy book i think is a great way of of being an artist steve that was a tremendous point i think that's a great way for us to finish today because you've used that great phrase about virilio that he is the great outsider and he really is he's outside disciplines he's been outside of universities and in some ways, being inside gives him that claustrophobia. So he's very happy to be outside, to experience that interdisciplinarity. And in, indeed, he is still alive and producing this fantastic, poetic, difficult, powerful, but transgressive work. So thank you so much for that conversation. Really interesting. Thank you for listening to this podcast on Theoretical Times by Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Please feel free to contact us at Charles Sturt University.